church say amen. Let the church say amen. Come on and give God some real praise. Come on and give him some real praise. Real praise. Real praise. God is worthy of our praise. We thank God. We praise him. We honor him today for coming and seeing another day in which we've not seen before. To the ministers that are here in the pulpit, to our chaplain, to our deacons, our chairman of our deacon board, to our deaconess chairwoman, the former first lady, Mother Lula Mae Arterberry, the first lady, first lady Kimberly Renee Thomas, all of you, brothers, sisters in Christ, good to be in the house of the Lord again. Yeah. I don't want to be nowhere else. I don't want to be at the Masters. I don't want to be at the finest hospitals. I'd rather be right here in the house of prayer, amen, where things are happening. Things are happening. Anybody know that things are happening in the house of prayer? Amen. Choir, you know things are happening in the house of prayer. I hope you know that. I hope you know that. I hope you know that, amen. God is blessing and keeping us. What a blessing it is to be here today to thank God for all that he has done, all that he is doing, and of course, for the presence of his people. I know it's a wet, cold day outside. I came, I didn't bring a coat, a hat. I had a umbrella and that got taken from me, amen. I had a umbrella and that was taken from me, but I'm thankful that it's a short stroll, it's a short stroll from the parking lot to the building, amen. I pray that all of you be careful be careful when you leave here today. You know people in California don't drive good when it's raining. Amen. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? Yeah. Some of them are you people. Some of them are you people. Amen. So be careful. <laughs> be careful when you leave today. Listen, a couple of things I want to remind you of. Listen, don't forget next Saturday. Next Saturday we do have our ODAT ministry. That is our grief ministry. And uh, that is taught by myself, my wife. It's for those of you, those of us, who are having a difficult time getting past our grief. Amen. Uh, this morning, it'll be three years in July uh, that my brother passed away. And this morning, I heard a song that I sang a little bit of at his funeral and began crying while I was driving to church. It's still real for me, uh, his, the loss of my brother. So I know if I'm going through that, I know there are others going through that. So listen, don't forget, Grief Ministry, if you've not attended before, please come. Please come. That's going to be on next Saturday at 10 a.m. But then we have our bridge ministry. Our bridge ministry is for our singles. Amen. Singles, those of you who say, I'm not necessarily looking for somebody. Amen. But I just want to make sure that I'm learning the principles the values, the doctrine of God's word, that way when God sends me somebody, I'm prepared. Amen? So that is next Saturday, 1130. On April 27th, all of our couples, if you're married, engaged, stand up. All couples, all couples, stand up. You, amen. Oh, my God, the whole choir. Amen. Uh, couple up with somebody. Listen. Want you to sign up today, today. We only got about 10 more days to sign up for the Couples Conference, Marriage and Excellence Conference. We have a great sister who's going to come and share with us some principles and some values as it pertains to how to strengthen your relationship. This is not counseling. We're not prying into your business. Amen? We're learning what thus saith the Lord as it pertains to relationships. Relationships. So you need to sign up. We want to see you there. Amen. Some people married didn't even stand up. That's interesting to me. Uh, I ain't going to point you out. I ain't going to point you out. But that's your, don't look, Deacon. Don't look. Uh, it's interesting to me, though. Uh, but listen, I want you to sign up today. Amen. Sign up today. You can go online and sign up. Uh, you can sign up today. Minister King, Minister Parker, uh, they can deal with you after church. But won't you sign up today? Today. Amen. Don't forget, give God a hand praise for those who, those who are involved in the marriage and excellence ministry. On April 28th, we have our ushers and first aiders annual day. Uh, don't forget, that'll be celebrated at our 10 a.m. service. We want to thank our ushers for all that you do, for all that you put up with. Amen. The headaches, the frustrations, the anxiety. 
of folk coming to church mad because it's early in the morning, uh, mad because they stuck in traffic, mad because they got drugged to church, amen, whatever the case may be, we want to thank you for all that you do to assist and to help our brothers and our sisters as you usher them into the church, our first aiders. Uh, we're going to celebrate you on the 28th. Please plan accordingly. That will be at the 10 a.m. service. And then we have our 100th anniversary Save the Date flyers with information. They're in the foyer. Some of you had those mailed to your homes. Others, please pick up a flyer on your way out today. Big stuff they're planning. I say they. I'm not a part of the committee. Deacon Barry is the chairperson. All of those who are part of the committee for the 100th, just stand up real quick. Just stand up if you're part of the committee for the 100th. Amen. These folks are working behind the scenes, getting stuff done, set up. Thank you so much for all that you are doing to make the 100th a celebration to be remembered. Amen. Uh, I don't think any of us will be here for the 200th. I don't know. Some of y'all might. Amen. Uh, I don't plan on being here for the 200th, but I'm going to celebrate the 100th if I'm here for the 100th. Amen. Let me not take for granted. Only God knows. But Jesus, if you will. Amen. I plan on being here. Amen. All right. Listen, listen. Let me share something with you real quick. For uh, many of you know, um, before COVID, uh, for several years in a row, I would do a relationship series. Relationship series. And after COVID, we've not done one. But we're starting one in May, Relationship Series. Listen to me. Those of you who've participated in those know we keep it 100. It's a buck. We talk about sex. We talk about love. We talk about marriage. We talk about singleness, et cetera. I already have seven sermons outlined that will begin on May 5th and take us all the way through June. And the title of the series, I'm telling you because I want you to be in prayer about it, Love, Sex, and Lies. Love, Sex, and Lies. Here are several things that church folk normally don't want to deal with, but they're always thinking about it. Relationships, vision, and their money. And their money. I told the preachers, if they have a pastor, please, please, please make sure you do a series every year on relationships, on vision, and on money. Amen? Because people are always thinking about it. They just don't necessarily want to talk about it. So let me give you just a little peek behind the, the blanket, a couple of sermons that we're going to be doing in May and June. Burn, baby, burn. What do you think that's about? Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Adam, Contavious, Ricky, Mike, Bobby, where art thou? Where art thou? Sisters, we're going to deal with that because I know many of you have anxiety over these brothers out here who are playing games and acting foolish. Here's another one because we're going to pick on the brothers. We got to pick on the sisters. You have a headache again? My God, we need to get you checked. You've had a headache for three weeks in a row. We gotta get you checked out. Come on, you better give God some praise. You better give God some praise. Y'all know we keep it real. We keep it real. What kind of woman are you? Wow. The Shunammite woman. Second King. Bible says she got money, she got a man. She's ministry minded. I already got my points. I already got my points. Amen. We're gonna deal with that. Then here's another one for our young people. Young people, listen to me. Listen to your pastor. Young people. The gift of celibacy and the reality of abstinence. We're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with that. Amen. So those are just some of the things we're going to be dealing with in May and in June. As you know, there will be one or two sermons where I'm going to tell you, do not bring your babies in here. They got to be upstairs. Amen. Those who are 18 and below will have to be, well, no. 16 and below will have to be upstairs. 17 and 18 should be with me. Amen. Because this is real stuff that you're already talking about and dealing with in high school. Uh, but this is serious stuff. I want you to be in prayer, be in prayer. Love, sex, and lies. Amen. That'll start on May 5th. 
Give God a hand praise. We'll deal with that in May. In May, the Lord says the same. Listen, we've got to prepare ourselves now for our altar prayer. Altar prayer, altar prayer. We're excited about what God is doing in spite of all that's going on in and around the world. Many of you know that Iran has technically attacked Israel. Might as well say. Sent hundreds of drones uh, in that direction. Uh, this is going to involve the United States. It already has, uh, unfortunately. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And we need to be in prayer. The Bible tells us that there's a time coming for us, I can say, and now is, where there will be wars and rumors of wars. That there's going to be things that's happening in and around our lives that we've never seen within our lifetime and never dealt with, and yet it's thrust upon us. No different than COVID was in 2020. And now all of a sudden, we got all of these wars that's going on that we're going to have to be involved in and praying for our sons and our daughters, our brothers, our sisters. I'm asking that you all be in prayer. The Bible does not tell us to fret. The Bible tells us that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. That means I'm supposed to go to the Lord and make my petitions, my concerns, I'm supposed to share with him. I'm not supposed to fret. I'm not supposed to cry. I'm not supposed to weep. But I am supposed to pray. I'm supposed to pray. So as we prepare our hearts and minds today for prayer, for those of you who are able to stand, if you're able to stand, please do so. I'm going to be reading several verses from Psalm 35. Psalm 35, if you're able to stand, please stand. Minister Olive is preparing himself to come here in a moment, and he will lead us in prayer. Psalm 35, a psalm of David, beginning at verse 1, these words are recorded there. O Lord, oppose those who oppose me. Fight those who fight against me. Put on your armor and take up your shield. Prepare for battle and come to my aid. Lift up your spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Let me hear you say, I will give you victory. And finally, verse 4, bring shame and disgrace on those trying to kill me. Turn them back and humiliate those who want to harm me. I just read for you the first four verses of Psalm 35. I would ask that during your time of devotion, your time of intimacy, your time of meditation, that you would go back and read all 28 verses of Psalm 35 in their entirety. Amen. For those of you who are able to remain standing, I'd ask that you do so. If you're unable to remain standing, please be seated. As we call upon the names of those who are sick and shut in, standing in the need of prayer. We're praying, of course, as I call upon the names, if there's a family member or friend within the body of Christ here today, please come and stand in the gap for Mother Rena Carter, for Sister Pat Johnson, for Mother Hattie Jones, for Sister Kathy King, for Mother Evelyn Mitchell, for Mother Queen Pritchard, for Mother Cora Taylor, For those who are on the special prayer list, we're still praying for Sister Sean Cruz, specifically her mother. We're praying for Sister Buffy Gordon. We're praying for Brother James Johnson. And I'd ask that you all continue to pray for my grandmother, Mother Ruthie Swanson, for some names that have come to me, some requests 
We're praying for Minister King, who will have a procedure on tomorrow. He's asking for your prayers. We're praying for the Soto family. 19-year-old daughter was killed in Long Beach last week. Her sister attends the school where Minister Parker is an administrator. So I'm asking that you all pray for this family. We're praying for the LaRue family, Sister LaRue's daughter, Crystal, who has had some health issues over the last couple of years that I'm aware of, is in the hospital, so she is asking for prayer for her daughter. We're praying for Lawrence and Linda Felix. That is the daughter, Linda, of Brother Deacon and Mother Turner. Their daughter, Linda, her husband, Lawrence Felix, is in the hospital, and they're asking for your prayers. We're praying for Sister Martha Norwood, who will have surgery in a couple of weeks. So we're praying for her. Uh, come to the altar, sweetheart. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. Yeah, yeah. Sister Karen, uh, we're praying for you. Can you make it down here to the, to the front? Come on, sweetheart. We're praying for you. This is one of my classmates from high school. Went to Fremont High School together, and she has... Several, sit right there on that front row, sit right there. Several health issues and praying for her. And this other sister here, Cheryl Brown, went to school with both of them. She alerted me that Karen was in the hospital this past week. And we're praying for you, that God would meet you at the point of your need. All others who'd like to come, we ask that you come now. Whatever the situation is, whatever the circumstance is, you don't have to be a member of this ministry. You don't have to be a, men, a member of this ministry. Uh, but whatever it is, we're asking that you come. You come. Uh, do me a favor. Uh, Tyrone, scoop that way. Scoop that way. Because we got a sister coming on a walker. I want her to be able to sit right there on that front row. So keep scooting that way. Go down, Mother Williams. Bless you, sweetheart. Come on, baby. Deacon, uh, you got her, Brittany? Okay. Your, your son is coming. He want he to help his grandmama. Let him help her. Sit her right down the front row. Sister just had surgery not long ago. And it's obvious, as you can see, she is still struggling in the recovery process. Tyrone, help her sit down for me. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sir. Bless you. This is the mother of S Sister Brittany Spivey. It's the mother of Sister Brittany Spivey. Amen. So we're praying for her. As she continues to recover, amen, I ask that you would draw your attention now, not to those who have come necessarily, not to those who are struggling to make it to the altar, but I'd ask that you draw your attention unto God, that you would focus on him, and that you would pray unto him that God would meet these that have come, those who are online who are struggling, those who are within the congregation that did not come, but yet you know you have some things that you're asking God to meet you at the point of your need. His word reminds us he's a very present help in our time of need. I'm going to ask that Minister Allah would come and lead us in prayer. Father God, Lord, as we continue in service, Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that you're pleased with all that's been offered up thus far, O oh God. Lord God, we come to you now, Lord God, humble as we know how. As children to their father, Lord God, we recognize and bless you for being God all by yourself. So, Lord God, we come with repentant spirits, first and foremost, O oh God, asking for forgiveness, Lord God, for those things that we've said, done, and thought. Lord God, actions we've displayed, Lord God, things that we refrain from doing, Holy Spirit, when you told us to. So, so Father God, we just come now seeking and asking that you would just do one more time, Lord God. You've blessed us so many times with so many things, Lord God, and yet we come again asking for more. Lord God, you said that we can cast all our cares on you because we, you care for us. So, Lord God, we come bringing our petitions, Lord God, our, our prayers, our concerns, Lord God. Help steady our minds, Lord God. 
Help us focus our thoughts, Lord God. May we not be distracted by things that we're uh, seeing and involved in, Lord God. But we just come to you now, to the one who is able to speak, and our situations can literally be changed. We come with faith, Lord God, knowing that you've blessed so many times in the past. We know that you have not ran out of blessings, Lord God. So we just pray now, according to your most holy will, that you would move upon each and one of our situations, Lord God. Bless each family represented here on today, Lord God. We yeah. thank you for this church, Lord God. We thank you for the gift of being able to come to you on behalf of others, Lord God, on behalf of ourselves and our families. May our faith not wane. May we not drift from your word. May we not drift from uh, being faithful attendees, Lord God, in service, Lord God, in Bible study. We just pray that we would continue to grow and move up the mountain of sanctification, Lord God, according to your will. And now, Lord God, have your way. Bless the sick and shut in, Father God. We pray some have been on there for a long time, Lord God. So we just pray and don't take for granted the fact that we get to come here in your house. So we lift them up, praying that you would heal them according to your will, that they can do the same, oh God, giving you praise, honor, and glory for it. Lord God, for the bereaved hearts, touch and comfort as only you know how, Holy Spirit. You are such a great comforter, and we thank you. May we continue to lean on you and lean into you in those times of, of grief, of times of down. We thank you for the gift of memory, of legacy, Lord God, of just family mementos that help us. Lord God, Holy Spirit, may we continue to walk the straight and narrow path. Now, Lord, we lift up this great country in which we live, oh God, the wars, the rumors of wars, things that's going on in this world. Holy Spirit, we just pray for peace in the land, Lord God. We know things will happen. You said in your word, Lord God, so we just pray that all those that are in position, that all those military personnel home and away, Lord God, will be covered. We just lift up them and their families, oh God, for um, just a blessing of peace. Keep them as only you can, Father God, and allow them to return safely and peace be restored in your land, oh God. Yes, God. Father God, we lift up this great church in which we're a part of, Lord God. This little church here on this corner, Father God, such history, such, such memory, and such accounts of how you moved, Lord God. You said in your word in, in Hebrews, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, all those that in, in your word, Lord God, in Bible times, we're restored, Lord God. We're strengthened, Lord God. And we have such a great cloud of witnesses here who have been on the prayer list, who have been in hospital rooms, who have received uh, illnesses, Lord God, and have overcome by your will. So we just thank you. We know that you have not run out of the blessing power. We pray that we continue to be a church praying and, and preaching and teaching your son, Jesus Christ, Lord God, that we can lift him up and draw all men unto you, Lord God. We thank you for ministry. We thank you for this church, Lord God. We lift up our pastor to you, Lord God. Bless him, encourage him in a very special way. Continue that he can continue on doing the great job, Lord God. Bless he and his family, First Lady, all those. All those names that have been mentioned, Lord God, we just lift them up unto you. And the unspoken prayers, Lord God, we lift them up to you even now. Bless each family, bless each relationship, bless each child, each young person. The schools, oh God, my Lord, the things that go on in the schools, we just pray for protection, Father God, of our babies. Now, Lord, as we move and continue in this service, we're ready to sing another song unto you, Lord God. We're ready to hear your preached word that can give us life, that can give us hope, that can convict and convert us, Lord God. So we just pray that you would just have your way. Clear our hearts and our minds even now, Lord God. We ask for removal of distractions, that we can receive this, your word directly to us, Lord God, and that can change and we can move forward, Lord God. It's in your son's Jesus' name that we pray. Lord God, we lift up the lost souls in the room, the lost hearts. Father God, you've been drawing and now this is their appointment time. May they have the courage to come forth when it's time, Lord God. Please, Father God, give them the courage, Lord God, that we can come introduce them to your son Jesus. For the one that is out of fellowship, at that appointed time, may they Take the initiative, Lord God, and come forward and rejoin and with commitment themselves unto your church, oh God. It's in your son's Jesus' name that we pray. We lift all these up unto you, oh God, and we say, have your way. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And we all said amen. 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 And amen. Give God a hand, pray.
Amen, amen, amen. Come on and give God a hand, praise the Lord. I'm not fighting for my own interests. I'm not fighting for my pet peeves, but I am fighting. I am fighting. Amen. Amen. We thank God and we bless him for all that he is doing with the choir and for our musicians. And, oh, good to see. We recruited another choir member. Brother Matthew was up there. Matthew was up there. There's still plenty good room. Amen. We thank God for all of you and let me just highlight once again, I did on last Sunday, uh, that this month is Autism Awareness Month, uh, and we highlight our brother Jamal, uh, who has autism, but is a gifted, a gifted <laughs> musician. And as I said last week, and I reiterate, he does not suffer with autism. He has autism. He's autistic, but he doesn't suffer from it. Uh, he's living his best life. Amen. Is that right, Jamal? Living his best life. Amen. Uh, we thank God for his mother and his family who have not withheld anything from him, but have made him uh, operate and uh, do things according to the purpose and the plan of God. And we're honored to have you, brother. Honored to have you here. As a musician in this ministry. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, how we bless, how we praise, how we honor you today. Oh God, we thank you for bringing us over the highways and carrying us through the valleyways. So much going on in and around our lives that if we were to stop and give too much attention to the sadness and the sorrow, to the suffering, situations, circumstances that are unbecoming. In many cases, we would not have even made it here to the house of prayer today. There's so many in the kingdom, Lord God, who feel overwhelmed. They feel defeated. And yet your word reminds us, is there anything too hard? For God. So God, we come before thee knowing and believing that you have spared us for a time such as this. We've come with joy in our hearts. We've come with praise on our lips, clapping in our hands, dancing in our feet. We've come, Lord God, revived. We've come rejuvenated. We've come re-energized, Lord God because you've allowed us to see another day here in the land of the living. Now, God, we thank you for all that we have seen, all that we have heard, all that we have felt thus far. And now it is the preaching hour, Lord God. I ask that you would touch the mouth and the mind of your servant. I pray, Lord God, that you would speak through me that which you've spoken to my heart. I pray that your words would go forth boldly and clearly, that they would accomplish all that you have purposed for them to. As your word reminds us, your word will not return unto thee void. Now, God, have your way in this place. I pray, Lord God, that you would lift up Jesus before your people. By way of your word, Lord God, that they would see the greatness and the glory of the one who was slain before the foundation of the world. If there's any among us who do not know you in the pardon of their sins, we pray that when the doors of the church are open, they'll come inquiring, what must I do to be saved? Now, God, as always, we are in your care. Continue to have your way in this place. It's in the blessed name of Jesus, our Savior, that we pray. Let all the people of God say, amen. Grab your Bibles and stand with us. I ask that you draw your attention to Jude, to Jude, 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 the book right before Revelation. Just go to the back of your Bible and just go back one book and you'll be at the book of Jude. 
Jude, not Job, but Jude. Amen. Jude. Should I say chapter one? Okay. <laughs> uh, people know they Bible. It's only one chapter. It's only one chapter. Amen. Jude chapter one. I'll begin reading there here in a moment. But before we do that, we have to do our theme for the year. Family, are you ready? Yes. Y'all sound ready. Family, are you ready? Yes. In 2024. Understand this, dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So, wait, wait, wait say it again. Amen, amen, amen. Keep going, keep going. Do what it says. Otherwise, that's James what? All right. I want you all to be a little louder and a little bit more distinct when you say get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word that God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your soul. I want you to be very, very specific when you say that because that is a prayer. All of it is a prayer, but that is a prayer. Amen? That we're asking God to do. Amen. Bless you. Remain standing. Listen in Jude, in Jude, in Jude. That one chapter, beginning at verse 1. Here is what the Word of God says. I'm reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible. Here's what the Word of God says. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. I'm writing to all who have been called by God the Father. Save folk, amen. Who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. Verse 2, may God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Here's the key verse, verse 3. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all, for all time, excuse me, to his holy people. Verse 3 is the key, and from that one verse, I want to use the focal point as a theme for the few minutes we have left, remain focused on the faith. Remain focused on the faith. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The English Standard Version of verse 3 says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. According to tradition, the writer of this epistle, as he indicates in the first verse of this one chapter letter, is a brother by the name of Jude. Jude was the half-brother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and was the brother of James, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Dr. Stephen J. Krafchik, who was the former professor emeritus of New Testament interpretation at Candler School of Theology, Emory University, has said of this letter from Jude, and I quote, Jude is not an epistle one reads for comfort or to ponder esoteric questions about theology. It is a letter of challenge. It is a letter of outrage. And we are unaccustomed to this much passion in a letter. 
Within the 24 verses, which make up the entirety of this brief letter, Jude leaves no Christian out. He touches on everybody from the pulpit to the usher bench. He deals with everybody from the audio video ministry to the deacons and deaconess of the church. Choir members, musicians are included in his declaration and in his directive. The Bible tells us that we as believers are to contend for the faith. For many of us who have grown up in the 70s and 80s, you will remember that when there was a boxing match, when they got to the championship fights, they would tell you that somebody was the number one contender. That means that they had won enough fights and that they had enough skills and that they had reached an agreement on what the financial implications of the fight would be. And therefore, they would put the two in a ring in order that they would battle it out. It is interesting to me because Jude uses the word contend for the faith. In other words, we are to fight for that which we believe. We are to grapple with that which we believe. We are to get down and dirty in order that we would defend the faith that has been entrusted unto us. Every child of God must realize that he or she has been called to battle. Christianity is not a playground, it is a battleground. And therefore, you have to develop some skills on the playground of life in order to protect yourself, but also in order to defeat the enemy. And there are too many believers who are walking around defeated within the kingdom. There are too many of us who have been slapped around and pushed around by the enemy. And therefore, we have forgotten that we are to be fighters. We are to be soldiers. We are to be battlers. And the Bible continues to remind us that the Christian life is the life of one who is a soldier. It was the Apostle Paul who reminded us that no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he or she may please him who hath chose him or her to be a soldier. That means you are one who is dressed in the whole armor of God. That means that every day that you wake up, you are anticipating an attack from the enemy. That means every day as you go throughout your day, you are mindful, you are keenly aware that the enemy is going to try to come against you on every hand, that he's going to shoot darts, that he's going to shoot missiles, that he's going to drop bombs in your pathway to get you off track. And yet many of us refuse to prepare ourselves for that which is to come. But Jude is saying here, listen, as believers, as saints of God, you have to be mindful to contend for the faith. He is saying, remain focused on the faith. The book of Jude here is teaching us that we must be careful and faithful of the faith that has been entrusted unto us. The Bible is dealing with something that is called apostasy. Apostasy. For those of you who have not heard that word, apostasy is turning against God. Apostasy is evidenced by the abandonment and repudiation of what we formerly believed in. You grew up in the body of Christ. You were taught from a baby how good God is. You were taught from your adolescent that God is the only true and living God. 
and yet you grew up and the philosophies of the world have taken root in your life. You have gone out and got a college education. You have gone out and experienced some things in the world and now all of a sudden you have believed the apostasy of the enemy. So now you believe that it's okay for you to deliberately renounce the faith in which God has placed in you. But the devil is a liar. I may have grown up in the church. I may have strayed now and again from the church. But the church is still embedded in me. I am remaining focused on the faith. The faith that God gave me when I called upon the name of Jesus. The faith that God instilled in me when I surrendered my life to him. The faith that carried me over mountains and through valley ways. That faith that lifted me from a bed of affliction. The faith that restored my marriage and protected my children. The faith that covered my home, my cars my life, my business, the faith that kept my mind regulated when I should have lost it, the faith that kept me moving forward when I wanted to fall by the wayside, the faith that made me want to curse you out and yet I held my peace, the faith that made me praise with tears rolling down my face, the faith that made me run when I wanted to crawl, the same faith that God gave then is the same faith that we have now. It's the same faith. But you have to remain focused on the faith. Jude not only encourages us, but Jude lays out a blueprint of behavior that is indicative of what he believes. In other words, he provides for us an example of what it means to remain focused on the faith. What's the example, Pastor? I thought you'd never ask. The first thing that I see in the text is Jude's unashamedly understood his call. Jude unashamedly understood his call. The Bible says, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude unashamedly understood his Call. Well, how do you know? Because notice to whom Jude addressed his admonition. Jude emphasizes in this verse exactly whom it is he is addressing. He uses the word you, showing that these instructions are for every child of God. This is not for the preachers, or he would have said, you preachers. This is not just for the lay people, or he would have said, you members. He says you as a blanket statement to the body of Christ in general. There are many people who strangely believe that faith was given to preachers and theologians for safekeeping, but the devil is a liar. The gospel was given to all of us. The faith was given to all of us for safekeeping. Not for us to hide it, but for us to exhibit it by way of our behaviors and the manifestation of our actions. That means that every believer ought to be able to move forward in the process of your Christian experience exhibiting a faith that literally pleases God. The Bible says now faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
God. Uh, where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound by way of my faith. Uh, every attack that the enemy throws against you, you need faith as your shield in order to respond and to defeat the attacks of the enemy. But there are too many believers that are walking around silent, that are not convicted in their walk. They are literally walking around in a stupor. They know no verses. They know no prayers. They do not call upon the name of God. They foolishly believe that it's the pastor, it's the preacher's responsibility to usher in the spirit of the true and the living God. Oh, how false, how foolish you are. Baxter Cyclone Mac McClendon, a preacher from yesteryear, has said this. It is not those who oppose and attack the word of God who are the greatest enemies of the cross, but those who are silent and do not come to its defense. Those who do not witness for it, they are the most dangerous modernist. Do you know that the enemy wants you to be silent about the goodness of God? Do you know that the enemy takes pleasure when you don't clap, when you don't praise, when you don't shout, when you don't worship? Do you know that the enemy laughs and grins when he looks at how far it is God has brought you from and you have the unmitigated gall, the unadulterated nerve to sit and act as if you grew up with a silver spoon in your mouth. Don't you know that the enemy is celebrating you to keep your mouth closed in the midst of the goodness of God? Well, guess what, enemy? Today is a new day. I'm going to shout. I'm going to praise. I'm going to worship. I'm going to thank. I'm going to have joy in the midst of everything that God is doing for me. I believe. I believe. I believe there's some folk in here that God has healed your body. I believe there's some folk in here where God has made a way out of no way. I believe there's some folk in here where God has been a bridge over troubled water and a rock in a weary tide. I believe there's some people in the house where God has regulated your mind delivered you from drugs, got the taste of alcohol out of your mouth, and yet you can't praise him. Oh no, not today, devil. Today I got to lift him up because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. The first thing that I see about you is Jude unashamedly understood his call. He said, I'm going to tell you whether you want to hear it or not. He says here that as believers, though he intended to write about one thing, he found it necessary to write appealing to them. I'm begging you. I'm pleading you to contend for the faith. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 1 verse 8. I thank God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. What would San Pedro be like if our faith was spoken of throughout the city? What would Corona be like if our faith was spoken of throughout the city, what would Long Beach be like if our faith was spoken of throughout the city? Remain focused on the faith. Jude gives us an example because Jude was unashamedly, he understood his call. 
But not only did Jude unashamedly understand his call, Jude unapologetically understood his calls. Your calls and your call are different. Jude said, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you, beseeching you, begging you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. While apostasy is the main theme of the letter of Jude, it is not where this epistle begins. For the Bible tells us that Jude's desire was to write of his and the people's of God's common salvation. Common salvation. Interesting terminology. Common salvation. Our salvation is not common in the sense that it's cheap. Our salvation is not common in the sense that it's plain. Our salvation is not common in the sense that it is ordinary, but it is common in the sense that there's only one plan of salvation for all people. I don't care how you try to sneak around through the back door. I don't care how many hookups you may have in the church. There is only one way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. Christ. Religion has done a good job of confusing the issue of salvation by way of the grace of God. However, while man has come up with a variety of different plans, the Bible reminds us that there's only one way to get to heaven. Jesus said himself in John chapter 14 verse 6, he said unto him, I I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father unless he's a member of Mount Sinai. That's a lie. Then no man cometh to the Father unless he's a consistent tither. That is a lie. That no man cometh to the Father unless your mama or your daddy's name is written under one of the stained glass windows. That is a lie. A Unless your name is etched on one of the pews, that is a lie. Jesus said that no man cometh to the Father but by me. There is no workaround. There is no go around. You cannot dig deep enough or climb high enough or go out wide enough to get around Jesus. Because Jesus is everywhere at the same time. His omnipresence cannot be avoided. It cannot be shunned. Jude loved and enjoyed his salvation. Yet he says here that he wanted to talk to them about the commonality of salvation. But he saw fit to tell them about contending for the faith. And I don't know about you, but there are many of us in here that don't even remember much of our life before salvation. The fact of the matter is, the newness of my life has taken over my mind and literally erased my past. The same way God has wiped the slate clean, he has done a new work in my mind by the transforming of my mind. He has renewed my thoughts and my behavior. When I look back at my past, I look at it as a testimony to strengthen me in my present and for my future. Mark Twain said, the two most important days of anybody's life is the day you were born and the day you realize why you were born. Anybody know why you here? I know why I'm here. My cause is to preach the gospel. My cause is to live for Jesus. My cause is to spread joy and peace and hope. My cause is to step on the head of the devil every chance that I get. Paul said to live is Christ. To die is gain. You ought to know why you are here.
Jude unashamedly understood his call. But Jude unapologetically understood his cause. His cause was to share the gospel and to live the gospel. Do you know you don't have to be a preacher to share the gospel? How you live is an indication of the gospel that lives in you. If you say to me, Reverend, the gospel is meant to be shared by those who are educated, by those who are articulate, by those who have been schooled, and yet don't realize the fact that God has delivered you from some things is a sermon within itself. You may not know all of the biblical nomenclature, but you ought to be able to say to anybody that what God has done for me is for me. That what God has delivered me from, he delivered me from. And you know what I've learned along the 32 years that I've been saved? Can't nobody tell it like I can tell it what God has done for me. You can't tell my testimony like I can tell my testimony. You can't tell what God has done for me the way I can tell what God has done for me but you got to know your cause. Bible tells us that there's only one way. For the Bible says in Acts, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jude unapologetically understood his cause because his cause was to point to Jesus as the way. There is no other way. The, 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 this edifice won't save you. Coming to church does not save you. If you go home right now, those of you who are small enough, and climbed in your oven, heaven forbid, you won't become a chicken or a roast or a turkey. If you go home right now and stand in your garage, you will not become a car. But if you've accepted Jesus, oh my God, my cause for living is becoming cemented and concretized in my mind. I know exactly every day that I get up, I know exactly why I'm here. I'm here to praise him. I'm here to glorify him. I'm here to exalt his name. And I'm here to share him with all those who will listen. Jude, 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 my boy Jude unashamedly understood his call. But also Jude unapologetically understood his cause. And finally, Jude unambiguously understood his constraints. This is where we get left to center. The Bible says, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you, about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Though salvation was heavy upon his heart, God had other plans. The constraints it are that no matter what Jude wanted to do, Jude had to follow the direction of the Holy Spirit in order to scribe what it is that God wanted said. The Bible tells us that he says it was necessary. Well, who 
determined that it was necessary. The Holy Spirit of God. Jude said, I would prefer to talk about the commonality of our salvation. And yet, I got to reprimand you because we're not contending for the faith. Though salvation is heavy on his heart, God has other plans. And I don't know about you, but when God has other plans, it's better to follow the plan of God lest ye end up in a big fish experience like my boy Jonah in the Old Testament. God had a plan for Jonah to speak to 120,000 Ninevites. It was the greatest revival we ever heard of in the entire Bible. And yet the Bible says that oh Jonah that Jonah had other plans he had a cruise that was scheduled at the same time as the winter revival and God says Jonah I want you to go and Jonah said God you know I got other plans and God said to Jonah Jonah I want you to go and Jonah said God I said I have other plans and God removed his hand of constraint off Jonah and allowed Jonah to get on a ship going in another direction. And the Bible says that Jonah, look at the consciousness or the lack thereof of this prophet, this man of God. The Bible says that Jonah goes, goes to sleep in the midst of a great storm and the people on the ship who aren't even saved, the people on the ship who aren't even God's people recognize something was wrong. They said we've taken this trip a thousand times and yet we ain't never seen water rising like this. I've never seen wind blowing like this. I'm coming down your street. I've never seen my financial situation this bad. I've never had problems with my husband with my wife like this. My kids have never after the fool like this. just maybe just maybe God wanted you to go in another direction and he's trying to get your attention the Bible says they threw Jonah overboard the Bible says a big fish came along and swallowed him up and guess what when you're in a fishy situation when you're in a dreaded situation when you're in a despondent situation guess what Jonah did the Bible said he began to pray. He began to pray. He began to pray. And guess what? Some of us know the last time I prayed, I was in a bad situation. The last time I prayed, I was in a despondent situation. The last time I prayed, I was in a depressed mindset. And the Bible said God told the fish to go spew him up on the land. The Bible said Jonah was rolling. Jonah was running. Jonah was going. He went to Nineveh. And the Bible said when he got to Nineveh, he acted a fool again. He did not understand the constraints of God. Many of us that have grown up, raised our children, have been annoyed over the years when your kids don't understand the constraints you place upon them. Why do I have to do it? Now let me tell you because I don't want you to go to jail. <laughs> but my wife has shown me that if you bend your finger slightly with an angle, you can hit your child in the ribs and they never bruise. They never bruise. They can go tell all the police and all the people they want and my wife sits there innocently like, I don't know what you're talking about. The constraints Jude understood 
that I must do what God tells me to do. When it comes to the faith, do you understand you must do what God tells you to do? He's not asking you. He's not begging you. He is instructing you. And he said, go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. He says that you're supposed to go everywhere and anywhere for the sharing of the gospel. And some people say, well, pastor, I want to go to Africa. Why don't you witness to the people on your pew? Witness to the people in your house before you concern yourself with going someplace else. There are constraints in Jude. And Jude, my boy Jude, he unambiguously understood his constraints. I'm going to remain focused on the faith. Not just a faith, but the faith. I'm going to stay focused on the unadulterated. I'm going to stay focused on the uncompromised. I'm going to stay focused on the undeniable. I'm going to stay focused on the untainted faith that can only come by way of God. There is a faith that God has placed in my heart and I'm going to stay focused on that faith. I'm not going to allow the enemy to get me down. Come what may, my my faith is in Jesus Christ. I want a faith that is unabridged. George Clinton, I want a faith that is uncut. I want a faith that is unedited. I want a faith that is unexpurgated. I want a faith that deals with my issues, fixes my problems, that lifts me up, that makes me go forward. I want a faith that energizes me. I want a faith that calms my nerves. I want a faith that puts joy in my heart. I want a faith that puts singing in my lips. That puts joy in my heart. That puts peace in my mind. I want a faith that says go when I say stay. I want a faith that brings me up when the world's trying to bring me down. I want a faith that says I can when the world says that I can't. The faith that can only come by way of the true and the living God. I'm willing to fight for it. I'm willing to wrestle for it. I'm willing to grapple for it. I'm willing to take whatever it takes in order to do what God says do. The question is, are you willing to contend for the faith? Is there anybody in the house that says, I'll fight, I'll fight ain't never had a fight in your life, but I'll fight for the faith, I'll fight for the gospel, I'll fight for the Bible I'll fight for my joy I'll fight for my peace, I'll fight for my God duty contend for the faith that was entrusted to you. Would you entrust your greatest possession to a place that's been broken into once a month for the last five years? Would you entrust your valuables into a safe where everybody has the combination. The gospel of Jesus is valuable. And God does not entrust it to those who are not responsible and accountable for contending for the faith. I remember, I'm done. Karen and Cheryl will remember this guy. Both of them, actually. 
two good friends of mine, high school. Clifton Tony, Dari Caldwell, y'all know, my boys. Dari was dating a girl who went to Locke. Hmm. We attended Fremont. Well, if you can well imagine, there were some issues between Fremont and Locke. We convinced a good friend of ours, Julius Turretine. Y'all remember Julius? Big Julius. He didn't run with us. He was a good dude. But Julius had a car. And we were all good friends. So if we wanted to roll off campus at lunch, Julius would let us have the keys to the Vega. He had a Vega. <laughs> and we'd go off campus. So Dari is dating a girl who attends Locke. There are no cell phones, no pagers. So we just decided to go to Locke. When we get on campus, lunchtime, and we're walking around, but we got on our, our Fremont colors. We got on our, because we ain't scared. Ain't nobody scared, Deacon Williamson. This ain't Arkansas, baby. This is LA. <laughs> we got on our colors, man. We, we, we rolling through campus. Here's what's interesting. Everybody knows we don't go there, because everybody looking at us. Dory finally sees his girl sitting on the bench, football player, hugged up at lunch. So I say, being the that I am, <laughs> and my girl, I'm going to go over there and say something. Dory goes over, says something to the girl pushes the guy, all of a sudden, like 20 guys come around us. There's three of us. And, and let me be clear, Dari would fight. Everybody knew I would fight. Tony, not so much. Not so much. We get off campus, like, let's go, security's coming, let's go, let's go, let's go. We leave, we get off campus. All of a sudden, somebody said, hey, and we turn around, there's like 30 guys behind us coming off camp. We get ready to run to the car, which is parked on 100. Is that where Locke is? Avalon or something? St. Peter or something? Car is parked up the street. We get ready to run to the car. Now, unbeknownst to them, Dari, who I think, Dari doing life in prison? Yeah, he'd been in for like 25, 30 years already. My cat used to be, used to be my cat. We went different directions. We did. Good dude, good dude. There's a sawed off shotgun in the hood of the car. So we just thinking if we get to the car, click, click, everybody will back off. But these guys are running fast. I'm not gonna make it to the car. So Dari and I stop. What's happening? Oh, you want to fight? Blah, blah, blah. All this stuff. Dari and I, they don't know what we got because we ain't acting scared at all. It's like, y'all want to fight? Let's do it. You too, us too. What y'all want to do? But Tony is running to the <laughs> So we think he'll get in the car, bring the car, get us. Security comes, pushes the guys on the gate, and as they lock the gate, Tony comes driving down the street. I said, man, what happened? I couldn't get the car. Now, we didn't drove this car for like a couple of years. Never had a problem with the car stop, ever, until that day. That was the last time 
I went anywhere where I thought there'd be a party with Clifton Tony. Bless his soul. He passed away. He lived right up the street. Right up the street. Last time I saw him was right in the parking lot of the church. When we used to do Wednesday night Bible study, he saw my car and came over and said hello. Last time I went to Wilmington, where I thought something was going to jump up. I don't want to be in the faith with people who won't contend for nothing. I want to surround myself with people that I know will fight. People that ain't scared of the gospel. They're not scared of the attacks of the enemy. They're not scared to speak what thus saith the Lord. They don't care about the criticism. They believe that the word of God speaks for itself. Remain focused on the faith. In the midst of these chicken dinners, popcorn sales, auxiliaries, whatever you've got going on, remain focused on the faith. Let me tell you, going to break your heart, going to break your heart. Mount Sinai ain't the end all be all. But Jesus is. Mount Sinai ain't the end all be all. You, you do know I was saved when I came here. I didn't get saved after I came here. I was already saved when I got here. There's a commonality we have in salvation. The question becomes is how many of us are fighting for the faith? Jude gives us an example because Jude unashamedly understood his call. So he said, I ain't scared of y'all. I'm talking to you and you and you and you. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not intimidating. He understood his call. But not only did Jude unashamedly understand his call, Jude also unapologetically understood his cause. My cause is to spread the gospel. He was called into salvation, but then God used him to spread the message of salvation. You're supposed to be walking, talking, testimonies to the goodness of God. Some of us are so embarrassed about our past. I don't want to tell anybody that I used to be on drugs. Well, why don't you just tell them how God delivered you from drugs and let them figure out the rest. I don't want to tell anybody I used to be an alcoholic. Well, just tell them how God removed the taste of alcohol from your mouth and let them figure out the rest. Jude, my boy Jude, unapologetically understood his cause. But then finally, Jude unambiguously understood his constraint. I got to do it the way God said do it. Don't, don't ever allow the people, don't ever allow the members, don't ever allow the auxiliary or the deacons or the pastor, or the pastor, to how to share the message that God has placed in you. Can't nobody tell it. I can tell it what the Lord has done for me. Remain focused on faith. God has spoken. And blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be, blessed be, blessed be the name of the Lord. We are standing around the church. And I was told I had to hurry up with the call to discipleship. Barry and Sister Roberta. Let me stay serious. Let me stay serious. Y'all need to laugh sometime. The Clippers gonna lose anyway. They gonna lose. 
My God. No. Listen, this is the most important part of the service right here, right now. The most important part. This is more important than the exegetical delivery of the sermon. This is more important than the great singing and great playing of the choir musicians. Right here, right now is decision time. And there are people in here, you need to make a decision. What side of the track are you going to be on? Eternal salvation or eternal damnation? Because you're going to spend eternity somewhere. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, listen, listen, with great joy, with great joy, with great joy, I'm telling you, he died for you to have this opportunity. He hung on the cross for you to have this moment in time that he knew would take place even before the foundations of the world were created. He knew exactly what it would take to draw you unto him. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to come today. I'm telling you, he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's the sweetest name that I know. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to come. Is there one? We're not begging, we're not pleading, we're excited. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I'm telling you, this opportunity may not come around again. Is there one today? Is there one today? You don't know Jesus as your Savior. Is there one today? Is there one today? If you're scared to walk down the aisle, raise your hand. We'll come get you. We'll come get you. Is there one today? You're saved, but you don't have a church home. You're out of fellowship. That's not God's best for you. I'm telling you, that's not God's best for you. God didn't save you for you to stay outside the guidepost of church. If you're here today, you're saved, but you don't have a church home. We want you to come. I'd love to be your pastor. Love to have you as a parishioner. Is there one? Once again, we're not begging, we're not pleading. We're extending an invitation. Is there one? Is there one? Once again, if you're afraid to walk down, raise your hand. We'll come get you. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be ashamed. Is there one that would come? Last call. Last call. Last call. Last call. Finally, family, finally. For those of us who struggle with the concretized faith in which God has placed in us, we find ourselves at times living beneath the privileged potential in which God has ordained over our lives. And you say, I need an extra boost. I need an extra shot of that concretized faith. I want you to come. I just want to pray with you. I just want to pray with you. Just act like it's just me and you here. Me and you and Jesus. Nobody else. Don't worry about nobody else. You say, man, I'm getting older. My body is starting to do things that I've never had it do before. My mind is shifting. I'm unable to stay as focused as I used to be. I'm concerned because it seems like stuff is happening in schools and in the community and in the city on a regular basis. I'm not intimidated, I'm not scared, but I'm concerned. I want you to continue to contend for the faith. I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you, amen. I just want to pray for you, amen. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you, amen. I want to pray for you. So, let us pray. God, our Father, how I thank you for these, your sons and your daughters. These that commit me unapologetically, unambiguously, in believing God, you called them for a time such as this. In spite of sometimes how they feel, we know we're not by 
what we feel. We're not to walk by that which we see, but we're to walk by faith. God, we ask for a double portion, a triple portion of faith. And this morning, Lord God, you are opening doors that have never been opened before. You are allowing us to see revelation that we've not seen before. The enemy is doing everything he can and to deter us. So God, we ask now that you would touch we ask that you would move on behalf of your people. We ask, Lord God, that you would undergird them with peace that passeth all understanding. We pray that you would give them clarity of mind and thought. We pray, Lord God, that you would energize and strengthen them from the inside out. Those who are struggling with doctor's visits, God, the outcome. Pray that your power, your authority would go before them, Lord God, and that you would clear the way for them. That they would go in boldly and confidently, knowing that you've not brought us this to leave us now. God, we ask right now that you would regulate our minds, that you would allow us to lay aside the weights and sins of worry. That you would help us, Lord God, that we would not be anxious for anything, but that through prayer and supplication, we are known unto thee. Now, God, we pray that today the seed has been planted, that you will come along in some form or fashion, and you will water it, and it will grow, Lord God, and the increase belongs unto you continue to have your way lord god of our sinful and our selfishness anything we've said anything we've done anything we've thought is unbecoming of christian men and christian women that hinders from reaching the throne room of heaven forgive us right now in the name of jesus now god continue to have your way we're in your will. It's in Jesus' name. Let all the people of God say, amen, amen, and amen. Give God a hand praise. Make your way back to your seats. Give us a few minutes. We'll have you out of here. Give us a few minutes. We'll have you out of here. Amen, amen, amen. Make your way back to your seats, back to your seats. We're going to prepare ourselves now for our offertory period. My offertory period. Amen. 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 Listen, we are not a begging church. I say that all the time. But you do have a responsibility and an obligation. For those of you who are members of this ministry, you're to give into this ministry. We don't ask you to do anything above and beyond. We don't do auxiliary. Uh, what are those things we used to do? Assessments and dues. We don't do any of that stuff. God has blessed us uh, beyond measure. But we still have an obligation. Amen? We still have an obligation. So we pray that you would give back a portion of that which God has blessed you with. Keep in mind, we do not pay tithes. We bring tithes. You cannot pay unto God what belongs to God. And God said the tithe belongs to him. Amen? With that, I'm going to ask that you stand. Last time I'll say that today. Visitors, don't get mad at us. Last time. Last time. Last time. Amen. Last time. Minister King is going to lead us in our offertory period. Amen. Good, good morning again, family. The Bible says simply in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, every man according as he has purpose. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank and praise you for that which you have blessed us with, dear God. We pray, Father God, that you would just accept this that we are bringing, dear God, and that you would use it for the glorification of your kingdom. We pray for those, dear God, who struggle to give, dear God, to 
that you would just uh, promote their hearts and their minds, dear God. Elevate them to the level of being cheerful givers, dear God, trusting in you. In the name of Jesus. Yes, now, God. Father God, we just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand praise. Amen. Give God a hand praise, family. We're getting ready to roll. We're getting ready to roll. We're getting ready to roll. Amen. 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 Come on, show God some joy. Show him some joy. Amen. If you ain't clapped all day, clap now because you're leaving. Clap because you're leaving. Amen. Amen. We thank God. We praise him. Listen, don't forget Bible study without walls, Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Now, I've been telling you all to reach out to Sister Lydia, but I think if you go onto our website, you could just push a button and go on Bible study. Yeah? Okay, so if you go onto the website, if you go onto the website, you can just push a button on there. It'll take you right going through by chapter, by chapter. I just finished chapter three last week. This week, we'll do something a little different, and we'll pick back up the following week on chapter four, chapter five of the book of Genesis. Amen? Amen. Listen, family, we love you. We appreciate you. Don't forget, be in prayer for those who are on the sick, the shut-in list, those who are having procedures either this week or next week. They need your prayers. Amen? Lastly, to all of our visitors, first time and otherwise, we appreciate you. We thank God for you. Visitors, if you're visiting with us for the first time, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Visitors. Visitors, bless you, brother. Bless you. Amen. To all of our visitors, we appreciate you. We thank God for you. Uh, listen, please know our hearts, our doors are always open. And whenever you're in San Pedro, come back and worship with us again if the Lord says the same. All right, family, listen, we got to go. We got to go. Don't forget in 2024, I'm letting go and I'm letting God. But you have a part to play in the process. There's two things you have to rid yourself of and one thing you have to receive. Amen. What's the first thing you got to rid yourself of? Second thing you got to rid yourself of. And what's the one thing you have to receive? The word. God bless you, family. We'll see you next week.